I'm Alexandra Kreis and you're listening to Outer Travel in a Journey. Journeying now for 30 years into the life and practice of yoga, I have met many who have taken interesting turns, went past extraordinary bumps and reached unexpected places. People with whom I shared conversations about everyday struggles, intimate realizations, larger questions, ideas and dreams. So today I'm passing on the mic to one of them so we could hear and celebrate the wisdom in people's differences and experiences. Welcome back to our travel in a journey. On my show today is Kai Bolen. Hi Kai, how are you? Hi Alex, I'm fine. Hope you too. Yes, doing quite well despite the weather. We were talking a little bit before we came um, officially online about the daunting wintering weather <laughs> in connection <laughs> with lockdown corona in Germany. It's not so easy sometimes to find yeah. ease of mind. Um, hi, thank you for making time and for helping us to, to record this in English. So my dear listener, <laughs> you might have a bilingual, bilingual situation where I'm going to translate in between. So uh, bear with us because Kai's life story has something to tell. And uh, so Kai, we met at university, both trying to study social work. <laughs> yeah, quite a, a few weeks ago. Yeah, it's quite a time. <laughs> yeah, 30 years ago. That's 30 when years we met. ago. Yeah, and then we lost sight of each other. And the next thing I found out about you that you were diagnosed with HIV. And this is kind of where our lives intersected and where the, you know, like your already interesting life became even more uh, adventurous and dangerous. And so do you want to talk a little bit about the history and what brought you to become, um, yeah, who you are right now? Okay, well, I, I think the year 1999 was a very significant year for me because um, I found out that I had HIV, that was in March 1999. And a couple of months before I, um, had symptoms of, of the flu and something went wrong in my body and I felt quite strange. And I thought, well, this is not the usual flu. Something, something isn't right. I have to get that checked. And I went to the doctor um, and it took about a week and then I got the positive diagnosis. So, well, the thought was right. I had the, the you know, an intuition that it was HIV. And um, apart mm. from how this, this happened, it, it doesn't matter um, no. in my life how it happened. But um, from that day on, I have to focus on how, how could I move on with my life? What, what's going to happen next? And um, I think in retrospective, it was kind of an opener for me to look into more spiritual things, um, mm. what life means, what does that diagnosis mean for me? What, what, what's my job now to move yeah. on? Yeah. And that was, you know, it was a quite a traumatic time for a few years, maybe one or two years. I was in kind of shocked because I thought, you know, now my life is depending on pills and uh, visiting doctors and getting sick. That was my worst fear that I had mm. the, the symptoms that people suffered in the, in the early 80s when HIV and AIDS popped up, you know, in every society or almost every society and people died like the fleas. Mm. And um, yeah, that was uh, an image that I had of this disease. And it took a long time for people um, that were surrounding me who were working with, with AIDS, with people who uh, died from AIDS who, were, who got very mm. sick and they uh, recommended you know, take your time. Your immune system is still balanced, but you have to mm -hmm. keep watching. Oh. And um, I think it was around 1999 that I got in touch with a woman who uh, did practice as a healer. 
And mm -hmm. she recommended a book for me that was called, I think the, the, the English title is Sex, Death and Illumination. Wow. And this book, it's a, it's, an, it's a fictional story, I think with some, you know, elements that are based on, the, on, the, on reality, but it's an, an, a, an, a fiction story. And there's a woman appearing in this book, there's a guy who uh, got an HIV uh, diagnosis and who is on a spiritual journey. And he got in touch with a woman in the Westerwald in Germany who's mm -hmm. called Mother Mira. I think you have heard of Mother Mira. I have seen her many times. So. Yes, I've seen her too. <laughs> but it's a long time ago, but I've been yeah. there. And yeah. this and Mother Mira appeared in this book. And I always thought, wouldn't it be great if something like this woman is existing in reality? And at that point, I didn't know she was existing. You know, I thought she was a, a, a character made up by the author. Yeah, of course. This, would. Yeah, of course. And then um, the woman who, who gave me the book, the healer, she said, you know, I found out that Mother Mira is practicing in the Vestavod. You can go to Darshan. It's for free. <laughs> and I thought, OK, I'll be the first person being there. So I, yeah. I got booked in mm -hmm. and I spent there my uh, first weekend. I think I did three weekends all in all over the years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, and. It was the first time I got in touch with kind of meditation. Like, you know, there's a silence in the room. You're um, in a room with many, many people, as you know, um, people from all different kinds, you know, different colors, di different um, um, walks of life, as we walks say. of life, jobs or whatever. It doesn't mean that there, mm. there's no hierarchy in it. It's, it's, it's like people mm. are all equal. And that was a very great experience for me. And I even met people who I knew. <laughs> that, was, that was funny because I met a, yeah. um, uh, an actor. He's not a famous actor, but he was a theater actor. He was there with his, mm. with his wife. And, and we both stared at each other. We haven't seen in a couple of years. And he said, what are mm. you doing here? Mm. And I said, what are, you do what are you doing here? And that was mm. a, a fun, but also an enlightening experience. And, um, you know, being quiet and getting in touch with your deepest part of your soul, that was mind changing for me. Yeah, let's flesh this out to the listener in two ways. So in regards to Mother Mira, um, if you haven't encountered her, people call her an avatar and this has been widely discussed whether that's true or not. So meaning like a direct descendant from the greater consciousness, we would almost call it God in our Western world. Mm -hmm. And um, so what you do in being with her meditating is not the, what you maybe know from your other meditation retreats. He is just channeling consciousness. And when you go up to her to get your darshan, there is no word spoken. So it's the entire time for two hours, mm -hmm. you are sitting, you're sitting in this uh, long, big, silence and space almost and I admire you Kai because you are telling me that you never kind of had meditation training so for somebody to sit through a weekend like that that must have been a, a huge effort in the first place I that's what I'm thinking yeah and the other part before you answer this can because you can answer that all together is maybe you can also briefly um create a picture around what your professional life was, because even though we met at university, you never became a social worker. Yes, <laughs> so people get an idea of uh, your background and how you had to switch also years in life in regards to that. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, um, yeah, I, when we met, I was still thinking I would become a social worker back then, but I didn't. For some reason, I had, you know, um, an affinity to performing arts <laughs> but only the affinity I had to learn later on that you know there was something that wasn't quite right for me there as well so uh, I had my path always changed changed drastically you know it's uh, yeah. I don't know why that is but it is it seems to be my life my life way to to go to always look for a new direction and mm -hmm. that's it's it's challenging and it's uh 
Interesting also. It keeps yeah, you on I, your toes, obviously, and it abs- keeps you absolutely, alive, most absolutely. of all. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, I practiced as a, uh, I studied um, dancing, singing, and acting for four years um, at university in Essen. And after that, I was professionally on stage maybe for 10 years, almost 10 years. And um, yeah, that took me to different theaters, different um, experiences on stage, not always the best experience, I must say, because people always, um, you know, tend to project the profession of an actor or a dancer or singer with, with something they see on television, like something mm-hmm. people are living their dream and, you know, you're famous, everybody's admiring you. That's one side of the medal, but it's not mm-hmm. always the true side of the medal because it has a, you know, so many people work in the theater, they're not famous. They just do mm-hmm. it because it's uh, work from the heart. They love it, they love to do it. Mm-hmm. And I was always kind of divided, you know, I like a lot of jobs that I did, but on the other hand, when I had, for example, a director I didn't get along well with, there was a hard time because you have to rehearse with a person for six weeks or eight weeks that you can't get along with. That's Mm. a real challenge. The only relief in it was the thought that the director was going to be gone after six weeks. So you're released again and do your job. But that was just one, one side of my path. Um, I uh, did my last job in 2002. That lasted for a year. There was a theater in Hagen. That's a city close to where I live, to Dortmund. It's about you know 20 miles away. And um, during my uh, performance there, um, I got sick again. Mm. And uh, I got a big swelling on my neck this is you can't see it I have a long scar over here on my neck and um, it took half a year to get to know what I actually had and I they found out I had um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma stage three and um, it's a correlation between HIV and um, non-Hodgkin lymphoma oh, a, lot is of, there? a lot of people who have a suppressed immune system Mm. develop non-Hodgkin lymphoma. About Mm. 10 to 15% of HIV infected people develop this kind of cancer. And And you told me, yeah, and you told me at the time that it's um, more aggressive cancer than other cancers. I mean, one of the more aggressive cancers that we can encounter or has been recorded. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. From the, you know, the two different kinds of cancers, not there are many kinds of cancers, but you yeah, have a, a, a system cancer that is in the lymph system, mm-hmm. you know, your, your or leukemia that is in the blood system. Mm-hmm. And you have a, um, a cancer like breast cancer or prostate cancer that are, you know, tumors that you can find mm-hmm. in the body that mm-hmm. yeah. get radiation or chemotherapy to, to, to erase those. But my, my form was a very aggressive form but a very well treatable form also. You get a very um, hard chemotherapy and radiation. And I was one of the lucky 5% to um, survive and to thrive, of course, because I, I don't, I, you may know this from cancer stories, like, um, you know, if somebody survives or has lost the fight, there's always a fight in between Um, cancer diagnosis and the therapy people always are fighting and I never had the feeling of fighting not at all where uh, during the chemotherapy Mm. I've learned that I have to let go of things Mm. you know um, yeah not to hang on and there was nothing I could do yeah Yeah, not to cling that's right you have to let go and um, that means it's on many levels because I couldn't work anymore. I couldn't work for a year because I was so weak in a way. Um, And you also let go of people that you think or you thought they were very important in your life, but you have to let go because they can't, you know, um, get on the same level with you. 
because you during a cancer journey you're you're changing you're changing as a person you stay the same person you were you were always but um your thoughts go in different directions i must say i totally relate to what you say and uh, for some people and i remember that was one of the moments when we met and intersected again you were having come from severe diagnosis and struggles and you know almost kind of having to uh, look at your life and uh, deducing what is good for you and not, and me having kind of shifted through not so dramatic changes in my body, but also dramatic uh, experiences in work, uh, work-related experiences in social work. And I mm. wasn't ready to, to bear that any longer. And we intersected at that moment. And I remember very fondly of having this exchange on how we, you know, how we move forward through, through life by having to look at family ancestral patterns, who has come into our life to teach us, but as well, who have, do we have to leave behind? And um, yeah, so that's where, where we currently are in your story. You're telling us, you know, that's the kind of work, by the way, that I do with my clients mm -hmm. as well, that I try to help them if, if we want to heal. And even if it's not from a severe diagnosis and from a severe d disease but from those small little diseases that we have like where we get fat where we get lazy where we get brain fog which is already quite severe but for some people normal at this point and <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> we, we do need to look at the systems that surround us and that's where you kind of really cop on so do you want to tell a little bit about the methods that you kind of fleshed out for yourself to to help you to make these decisions. Yeah, I think the first big decision was that I didn't return to my work habit. My mm -hmm. work habit meant um, I did a lot of alcohol from time to time because I wanted to, you know, kill the, the pain in my thoughts that I had. Yeah. Um, and uh, it was, at that point, it was an easy decision. But in long term, you always try to, you know, look back, you see your old colleagues, what they have achieved in their careers, because you can't escape that, you know, you turn the television on and you see somebody and you say, okay, that was the one who was in my semester that we, we you know, we studied together. And that was kind of interesting, but it was painful for a time, for a short mm -hmm. period of time. But uh, I always knew that it was good to let go of this kind of work because it was there was no um, no base for me. Yeah. In, and um, so I had to define my life in a new way. Um, mm. I'm very happy married and um, in a great partnership as you are, and li like you are, I think. <laughs> and that's always that's also a, um, you know my husband is my rock in a way he supported yeah. me all the way through we knew each other we got to know each other when i was still at the theater mm -hmm. it was a strange world for him but when i got the cancer diagnosis he was he did manage so many things for me that was you know admirable uh, mm -hmm. i i don't know if i could have done the same uh in return i mean we had a challenge a health challenge for him a few years later when i was the one who took all the responsibilities and that also worked. I um, thought I couldn't do it, but I did. So yeah. you can't escape the challenges in life, you know? No. And um, the other thing was I, when you quit a job that is so much out there and you're so, you know, kind of a limelight, I say, it's yeah. not really the limelight, but you also lose a lot of friends because you're not on that level anymore. You can't talk about the theater, about films, about directors, about, you know, plays or pieces of films. That's gone. And, mm. um, but I knew I had kind of a creativity in me that wanted to go out, mm. but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't singing or acting anymore. It was something else. Mm. And so I sat down when I was in rehab after the cancer we have that system in Germany when you call, when you have a cancer uh, journey behind you, you are allowed to go and rehab for three to six weeks. Mm. And I did that. And I got in touch with a lot of people who um, 
offered me a way to look beyond the cancer, you know, um, because I was lucky, I was there, I was alive. And that was the situation I had to deal with. So what to do? I couldn't sit at home and do nothing. That wasn't my, you know, that's not my nature. I always have to do something. And when it's connected to creativity, that's the best for me. So what I did, I had my laptop with me, mm -hmm. um, no internet, of course, but I sat down and wrote down my story. Mm. And I intended to write a book, but it turned out differently. I uh, offered my story then to a, a cancer magazine that mm -hmm. comes out on a monthly basis. Yeah. And they um, released my story that is a long time ago in 2004. Yeah. And um, with that story in my hand, I started to do readings all over Germany. And it quite fell into my lap. You know, I didn't plan it. It just happened. It just happened. And um, I did it in some cancer circles. I went to rehab centers. I went to schools. Um, mm -hmm. And that was very interesting and freeing for me to talk about what I experienced. And I got such a good feedback um, um, with, with the people who are coming to, the, to these occasions. Mm -hmm. That was very, very enlightening because I um, people showed me that they have respect for somebody who has a biography that it's not the usual biography. Yeah. And I also spoke about some, you know, like the spiritual things I, I tried out in my life, you know, with um, the Clemens Kubi book I, I mentioned earlier. Mm. Um, that, Which know, we have mentioned on this uh, podcast. Yes, right. Which yeah. It seemed to really inspire you. So there is a German book by Clemens Kubi. Yeah, you can show it to the people. Show it, yeah. It's called yeah. uh, On the Way in the Next Dimension, to the Next Dimension. Uh, and Kubi is spelled K-U-B-Y for those who are listening only. And so On the Way to the Next Dimension and inspired you to, to find more inspiration how to heal and reunite yourself with yeah. the greater consciousness. Yeah. So yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah, there were two healers in that book. Clemens Kubi uh, injured his back very badly um, a long time ago. And then he went on a journey to find healers who could help him, you know, get him back on track. Mm -hmm. And two of the healers I got in touch with, um, the one is called Ushain, who produces goat ash powder. That is something you take orally and that is, um, you know, I, I think you can draw maybe um, a connection to Ayurveda somehow. It gives you the possibility yes. to open your mind and let your body heal itself. Yes. You don't get a drug or a medicine or whatever that is going to make you um, well again, but you take it in to give yourself the possibility to heal again, to open your channels, to, to um, be open to the universe. And the other healer was that was quite a funny story she um she's called Hia Park she's from Korea and mm -hmm. she does um I saw one setting of her on television and she got a, a drug addicted young man to, in the session to um leave his living body behind and go on another level to leave his body that was a mm -hmm. quite an experience to watch then And this guy never touched any drug anymore after that session. Mm. And, that was, and that was the point when I thought, if this woman comes close to my place, doesn't matter where, I'm going to be there. <laughs> and, um, and what she, were you expecting from her to do to you or for you? Um, I, I must admit, I was a little fearful to um, experience leaving my body. That was what I expected before I went into session with her. And something completely different happened when I was mm -hmm. with her. She was in Berlin in 2004 and I booked um, a session. It was about, I think, half an hour or 45 minutes. I can't remember well. And she connected myself with, with my inner child and something that was um, way back what happened to me when I was little. You know, yeah. some kind of connection that I've lost when I was little. At that point, I really couldn't click with that, I must mm. admit. But mm. again, uh, you don't have to understand everything 
in the moment when you're in it. But mm. when time passes, you get to know, ah, this what it was for. <laughs> that, mm -hmm. that was a mind blowing thing for me again, because mm. when you see your parents aging or when you see somebody die in your, you know, closer environment, Mm. that challenge, challenges you facing your own death or even an, uh, uh, an illness can f make you force facing your, your own death. Mm. But um, it also connects you with a lot of memories when you were little, mm. especially when your parents get older. You, mm. you know, you, you're always a child. My parents are still alive. Both are still alive. But, you know, every time when we're, um, chatting or having uh, a conversation via telephone you're always in the position of the child again yes and that you connects back into the role you're never the adult yeah yeah right yeah right um oh, I, at one point you think you're the adult you know when it gets on when certain decisions have to be made when your parents you know lose a lot of their stability or when yeah. they need a lot of help that's also not that much the point with my parents but um, I've seen it a lot happening around me so that was the time when I when that session with Hia Park came back to me in my mind oh. and that was good for me it was good to to get to know um, what it was for mm. so I I you know what I'm hearing us trying to say and I'm trying to direct to like yo I know you've done like uh, you done done so many different therapies alternative therapies you've been in touch with meditation mother mirror was mentioned yoga uh, is on your schedule every now and then whenever it's possible and and then there is homeopathy and I don't know what and you're telling me about all these great healers that you're finding access to so um, what does that leave you, you know, with as in healing forms, you know, what, because you have been challenged to look at a lot of healing forms, uh, alternatives as much as deep in modern science, you know, so mm -hmm. what is your conviction or what is your um, attitude to life? Is it like, oh, a lot of people, I'm asking this because a lot of people who get in touch with alternative science or, you know, like the uh, greater the Vedic science they want to teach it as well but I hear mm -hmm. you having so many experiences and I don't see you becoming a whatever doctor you know? <laughs> no no uh, well I, I don't see myself as a teacher I think um, I what I made is that I channeled a lot of things that happened to me in life and um, I made a decision what what can I do with this and I since I've learned that, I, that I'm not that kind of teacher like you are, for example, um, I think I have to do something with it. And um, there's another topic that I'm touching now. I uh, started um, sound massages a long time ago in 2007 with that singing bowels you see behind me. There's one. Singing bowls, one. yeah. Yeah, singing bowls. And um, it's just a... A, a space for um, relaxation in the first place. Yeah. Whatever happens to you in a session, you decide what's going to happen with you in a session. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. you don't. You ne I never um, concentrate on the problem that somebody has yeah. if I'm in session. It's always the the thought that is behind or beside the problem. That is the mm -hmm. one you can focus on because then you can let go of the problem. Mm. And I'm, I'm not focusing on any healing things in that sessions. And I haven't done sessions for quite a while now. <laughs> and last year, I have, there was also um, a decision to simplify my life a little bit. I had yeah. bought so many bowels mm -hmm. through the years. And I mm. got rid of a lot of stuff that I sold to a very spiritual woman from the Elfenbeinküste. Don't know yeah. that word in English. Elfenbeinküste? Uh, Ivory Coast. Ivory Coast, right. Yeah. Okay. And um, the other thing is, that's also quite a, quite a couple of years ago, I um, wrote that to you in the little summary you wanted from me. Mm. I'm working for the Telecare line. It's called mm. Telecare line, you know, Telefonseelsorge in German, but I think a lot of foreign countries call it Telecare line. Mm. And that is also something 
where I can channel what my healing process was. I can give something to other people that are in such, in such a dark place, mm. no matter what that means, if it's a health problem or psychological problem, but I have the time and I have the time to share and if it's just a few minutes or maybe half an hour, or sometimes it's 45 minutes, you can give those people maybe a little bit of lighter mood, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and the tendency is with the pandemic that we have right now, mm -hmm. that depression and all the psychological diseases are massively increasing. And At that the is- the forefront, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And it's, you know, I don't have the, um, I have a spiritual connection, but I don't have a religious connection. This is always mm -hmm. connected with the, with the Telica line because, um, you know, the headmaster of it is the, is the church, but I'm not in the church, but I'm working for it. But there's lots of people who are not um, members of the church anymore that are working at the Telica line. Yeah. And that really um, gave me so much because you always see there's some someone in the world who has who has such a a deep um, valley to go through, mm. and um, that I it puts my life in absolutely perspective again. Mm. That I'm really and, really I live a privileged life, you know. Mm. And and you don't, and you do, and <laughs> that you kind of you know like it's such. I'm, it's still a miracle to me that you're still alive you know like the, the, we were watching this movie um the Dallas Buyers Club you know and this guy who fought yeah. so hard in the 80s for to to get rights to see this this is just a virus uh, mm -hmm. you know HIV is first of all who who is not aware of that it's a virus in your system that needs to be activated and when it's activated it's AIDS. That's what we talked about in the beginning. Yeah. So to me, it's still a miracle that it hasn't been activated, but it seems to me also part of what we talked about privately um, that we are, we have to deal in all forms of healing. We have to deal with mindset and mm -hmm. uh, all forms of alternative healing are encouraging mindset shifts in some form or manner may it be quietening your mind through meditation or may it be just the idea of i'm taking something from nature that will heal me instead of saying it might heal me or i mm -hmm. doubt that it will heal me and that is a bigger part in our healing processes as it is so what you're talking about in the telecare lines is that you're going right to the source you're helping people to shift their minds for a second as a as a healing kind of drop or, you know, whatever it can be for them, a gem in the moment of darkness. I, yeah. I really am in awe with people who work on the, on those lines. It takes a lot out of you. I, I can imagine if you have a, a busy hotline, it can be quite daunting. How do you get out of the, how do you get out of work and what do you do after? Um, that's a good question. Um, you know, we, uh, we're in supervision on duty. You have to do supervision every three weeks um, mm -hmm. because that's, um, we call it psychohygienia. You have to, yeah. you know, to clear your mind again, to get some things out. And at the beginning, it was um, a, lot of, a lot in my thoughts, a lot of the stories that I heard on the, on the, on the telephone. But after a while, um, you realize that it's it's not you what's happening on the telephone you know these are other lives and you have to draw a line between you and what's happening on the other side and that is very healthy you mm -hmm. have to mm -hmm. you have to realize it's not your problem on the other hand i mean yeah. um even doctors had to had to have the same um, attitude actually because mm -hmm. what they see every day uh, look at the pandemic when people see yeah. how people are dying or had to be on the, these machines to get their yeah. breath. This must be very, you know, frightening in a way. Yeah. And that never caught me. I, I always, you know, when I go out, we have a secret space where we, where we do our job. And when mm. I leave the door, the thoughts stay there. Mm. And if there's something that is not, you know, that's catching me still, um, I look at it and the supervision that's mm. that's the best there was never a day when i thought you know um 
oh, I can't do this anymore, or this is too much for me, or um, there are days, I must say, when, you, when you're when you in a bad condition, when you mm -hmm. think, oh, how can I do this today? But, you know, when the first phone, uh, the first um, human is on the phone, then it's fine for me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a little bit then like, yeah, like when you, when you have that, um, how do you call, we call it uh, stage fright. In, mm. uh, in, in the theater world, you know? Mm. It's like the stage fright. And as soon as you have your, done your first step, everything is fine and you're relaxed and you're grounded. And that's, this is what it's all about. I really, I'm very thankful for that, for that mm. job. And it's, it's, it's yeah. very enriching. And what I heard you saying, and maybe this, we can bring this to a slow end. I could sit here forever with you. <laughs> I know, me things. too. <laughs> Yeah, because there's much in your life there. Uh, but what I heard you saying is that, I mean, in me, that's the same thing. When I stand in front of people and teach them Ayurveda, teach them yoga, I am being activated. You know, it's, it feels like I'm being activated. As, mm -hmm. um, and in the spiritual world, we would call it a channel. So, or like a hollow bamboo, you call it yeah. in meditation, you know. <laughs> I become just the bamboo and everything can flow through me. And because I have so much training in doing that, I often find that I'm not being affected by what's really going on out mm -hmm. there, by the stories, by the movements. And at the same time, because I am somewhere the observer in the same way, I learn so much. And that's what I heard you saying as well. You learn so much by kind of coming on stage and talking to people about... Um, your diseases and your experience around HIV and prevention and cancer treatment. And the same thing probably comes now into the more one-on-one -on -one conversation that yeah. you're becoming that bamboo for people and say like that there is possibility if there is a way out there. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It's always good to create a room for people to, to, you know, a safety room, mm -hmm. so to speak. Um, where you can, where people can be who they are. Mm. You, you know, there are no masks. <laughs> masks, that's a good, good word for, for, the, for the actual times. Um, yeah. Um, okay, yes, of course. Yeah, it took a while. It took a while. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, it's, you know, um, if you ask me if I have a life motto or you know a, a guiding thing through my life it's mm. it's like you know just stay open you never know what tomorrow brings you you mm. it can be that you know the world changes the next minute who would have guessed uh in 2020 that we all would you know communicate via video we're not uh, allowed to go out without a mask on we are you know yeah. and it, yeah. it's it's so much changing in the at the moment and I think um, we all, and people like you and me, or people who uh, like to reflect, we already start to create a new space uh, with the COVID-19 situation. We don't think of, I think, I mean, I suspect you don't think of uh, what do we do after COVID-19 because this will stay with us. We have to adjust. We have mm. to adjust with the situation. Yeah. Things will get easier, of course. They will mm. get easier with the vaccination or whatever they were going to do. But it's um, it's good. It's like with the cancer story you told, you know, like we're shifting thoughts. We need to shift thoughts with the because we're all not sick, but we're all experiencing sickness right. around us, which mm. makes us part of that process for other people. And so, yeah. Yeah, and experience stays. It never goes away. Experience stays. Mm. with you and you have mm. to you know integrate it into your body and your mind and your soul yes. and to move on this is uh, yeah. quite a challenge but i think it's the better way to live to integrate stuff that you have lived through i i love i love that and i'll leave it here as final words you know we have to integrate our experiences we can't pretend they are not there and hope um, to move on, just integrate whatever you can. Um, so I'm saying a big, big thank you, Kai. Namaste, thank you. 
Mm, and thank you, listener, and see you the next time or hear you the next time. If you enjoy listening to my podcast, please consider to become a patron at patreon.com slash alexandrakreis and pledge your donation. 